that some will have connected um, with us last week on um, the, the topic that, that Paul delivered. So just a, a quick few introductions. We're, we're grateful to have a guest today as well to, to lead, I guess, the delivery of, of this webinar, which we're focusing on the business of coaching. Um, but just quickly, so those of you that maybe I've not connected without with Scotland, uh, my name's Alan. It's, it's probably me that's been paying you a few emails. And if you've got a few email updates just before this was due to start, um, apologies in advance. I was struggling to join my my own meeting that I set. So um, just, just discard them and um, hopefully they didn't fill your inbox. But for those of you that don't know me, I'm Alan. I, I work for Scottish Squash. Um, currently as head of coach development and competitions. Um, also joining us, um, we've got Paul Bell, who's our director of squash, who led one of our webinars um, last week. Paul, I don't know if you just want to say a quick hello again, just so you pop up on people's screen and for those that don't know him. Yeah, I can do, absolutely. Um, I'll maybe kind of take the take the reins and and introduce Hirjun, who's going to be taking us through um, this webinar today. Um, I was really, really pleased that Hirjun agreed to come on and, and do this for us. He's had a massive impact on, on my coaching career. I'll try and avoid uh, making him blush during this intro, but um, we've we've kind of known each other and worked together for, for 10 years now, I would say, uh, starting off over in Ireland. And it's been great to, it's great now to get him involved in something for Scotland as well. Um, but he really helped and spotted me as a young coach. Uh, I don't know whether he saw something in me or whether I just bugged him that much that he uh, he just gave in eventually. But but uh, we were I think he was going through a, a bit of a transition period in his coaching and exploring a new new philosophy and and I was really intrigued with that and, and made the most of him learning uh, and passing on that that knowledge and expertise and that kind of will to to innovate and explore and try new things and and that. I was so fortunate to be around him at that point in his career and uh, it's been great to see um, how much impact he's been able to have on, on squash in, in the world and, and what an amazing business he has built up for himself um, as a consequence of being brave and taking a bit of a new approach and, uh, and obviously it's proof is in the pudding of what he's managed to, to create down in Bristol working with some of the world's best players. Um, so I guess I'll just pass it over to Hadrian and uh, just say thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to get involved and hopefully pass on some of that of your lessons that you've learned along the way to, uh, to everyone that's taken the time to get involved with us. So thanks, Hadrian. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul, for that introduction. Um, I probably did blush a little bit there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the feeling's mutual. Um, I was more than happy to to come and, and do this. Um, partly it's a great thing to do at this time for many reasons, but also, uh, you know, I've got a really strong relationship with Paul and our, um, yeah, our coaching goes back a long way. We've shared a lot of ideas and thoughts over the years. And as all you coaches will know and players that, um, you know, that's definitely part of the process. It's just, it's just not about being uh, isolated, it's about, you know bouncing ideas and 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 buzzing off people and that's something that we've always done and we still do now so yeah thank you thank you paul for for um for inviting me um and uh, yeah thank you for everyone else involved in scottish squash for helping make this happen um it's a great thing and uh it's, it's really pleasing to see obviously we've got people joining from um you know hopefully further afield as well and uh yeah welcome to all of you guys i can't see you out there but um i, I can see a lot of, lot of little round circles with names in so uh uh welcome to the to the webinar today um as paul just said from the introduction um my uh the, the objective is really to talk about the business of coaching uh the way that i'll do that in a second i'll share my screen with all of you and um just run through a kind of powerpoint presentation where i've made an attempt to really break down um, each, I suppose, stage of the process from start to finish, sort of showing you my journey um, in squash, which which has led to where it is now. Uh, and hopefully within that, plenty of um, insights um, and ideas that, that can help, you know, anybody in, in coaching and or involved in squash on any level, you know. So the, the point here is obviously, uh, for you guys to to engage as much as possible and um i'll break a couple of times during the presentation where we can 
just have any questions um, as, as they come to you. I'm not sure how long I'll be able to talk for. I'll, I'll give it a go. Hopefully not too long. Um, but when I feel like it's kind of a good time to break and, and, and if you have anything that comes to you, then feel free to fire away. And I think um, Alan's managing the, the questions from his control tower there. Um, so uh, we'll get started. Uh, we'll, I'll just share my screen here, make sure that's all working um, correctly for you guys. Um, just a quick one, sorry, Adrian, to yeah. jump in. So there, for those that weren't on last week, there's a chat function in Microsoft Teams. Um, just make use of that to throw in any questions throughout. And I guess Paul will, Paul will keep an eye on that as we go through. Excellent. Um, and are you seeing this OK? Alan, I've got you there. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Well, um, yeah, so the, the, the topic is the business of coaching. Um, and um, as I said earlier, my, my aim will be to, to, I suppose, run through my journey uh, in squash from uh, from start to finish obviously I'm not going to go into too much detail because it would take take a long time but um, to just pinpoint I suppose the main periods uh, my journey um, have have made a big impact and I suppose helped shape how things have come to where they are now um, I'll break through different areas starting with my background I'll talk about where where my squash began, my influences, um, talk a bit about the vision, where that came from, from Elite Squash, how that helped shape the brand, um, how then I kind of started to build a team around me, uh, which is a very crucial part of this process when you're talking about building a business out of coaching. Um, the reality of creating successful players and, and what part that played, uh, and then really the investment that that I've put into myself and into um, my understanding of business. I'm by no means a business expert, but obviously as the title suggests, in order to create um, a coaching business, you have to understand at least some elements of business which can help make that happen. And um, very often squash coaches uh, and squash players, we do what we do um, because we love playing and we love coaching. We haven't gone into business, which is a separate industry but then sometimes we need to bring that industry into sport and put those two together and um, you know that's something which I've had to sort of face and I'm still learning a lot about that as I go so I'll talk about those things and then just finally I suppose where where I am now where Elite Squash is now and um, uh, and, and what that kind of bigger vision could look like having said that under the current circumstances the uh, the landscapes changed quite a lot so uh, <laughs> that could could change change as we go so um, I mean, I'm just going to begin with with this idea that, you know, who you are is how you teach and really who you are is how you run the business. So as I said at the beginning of this um, presentation, um, I'm going to talk about sort of where my squash came from. And the more time I spend trying to figure out how to do things as well as possible, how to create, you know, a, a good business, have great people and, and really maximize um, elite squash and everybody involved in it, uh, the more I realize it's it's so much down to my attitudes, my beliefs, um, my strengths and weaknesses, uh, and particularly facing my weaknesses and accepting them and being able to, uh, to, to confront them and do something about that. So, you know, even when at this stage, before I've even started this presentation, when you're, you're talking about, you know, creating a business, I think a great place to start is with with yourself um, and and really figure out how to um, maximize that and ask yourself some really important questions which is you know what I've done all the way through this journey and yeah and and uh, that's how you teach that's how you run a business that's how you're a parent that's how you're a friend that's how you are you know so the better version of you you can be um, the more successful um, whatever you turn your hand to will be. And I don't think that that can be overlooked in um, in this this context, this discussion. So um, I started squash, uh, well, I was involved in squash clubs and squash worlds from probably like birth, basically. My parents carrying me, like I'm sure many people have had the same experience, but carrying me in a little basket of some kind into squash clubs um, being dumped in the corner, dumped behind the back of the courts and then growing up um, just being part of that environment and um, and that being my part of my DNA, I suppose, and, and being my first experiences um, 
as I was growing up and I started hitting balls probably from about three, four years old uh, after being in that squash environment so often, hitting a lot of balls. Um, and uh, and, and the, the person you see in the picture here on the left, um, dad on the left, mum in the middle, and there's a mini me there. I think what age, I'm probably about eight years old there. But, um, you know, this is one of the sort of pictures I managed to dig out to, to show you at least a picture of, um, I would say, probably the most key influence in my development in my life um both my parents for sure but maybe being a boy and having a, a father who's very um very sporty and uh you know just so influential the older i get the more i understand how much that's part of me and how much that's shaped what i do now um and uh i'll talk about that more as i go through but he was and still is um this kind of vision for me of uh of a great squash player particularly a great mover which is why movement is also much part of how i teach um and uh just his character and his way of, of presenting himself um himself um and and just being that that role model for me um and uh that is what initially has shaped and still does, um, how I do what I do. Uh, everything Paul talked about earlier, the risk taking, the creativity, all of these things, you know, he's all of those things and still is. Both my mum and dad live on a on a houseboat by the river and he's like 77 years old and still climbing up the mast and paddling up and down the river. You know, he's a, he's a kind of a maverick and it's been a crucial part of my development. So, you know, that's a big shaper for me. Um, and as I said, I started around three years old, I played, through the junior circuit in the UK. Um, and uh, I got to number one in the 19 British Junior Open final. Um, and I had, yeah, it's certainly a, a successful junior career, um, which has definitely helped shape my coaching. Now. Still does. And um, turned professional at 16. Uh, and uh, I didn't join the PSA tour until I was 23, actually, but I played the, the UK circuit from 16 alongside the junior circuit. I played senior and junior at the same time and, um, and then turned PSA professional around 23. Uh, I did that for about seven years, um, which took me to a, a high of World 52, won six PSA titles. Um, and these ingredients are important. Uh, you know, I appreciate we're talking about coaching business here, but set at the start to create um you know any any kind of business or have a big vision and make something special you have to draw on all of your experiences um i'm not saying you have to be a successful player to do that um but this is what has been me as my squash career um and many of my experiences have kind of come from that so as we kind of move forward these these realities of um my childhood and influences from my father and so on hopefully become kind of more evident and why did I start coaching well I started coaching at 16 alongside um being a player and that's always been something which has helped uh you know bring in some pocket money as I was as a junior into a senior and um and that's kind of when I started coaching and but the reason why I started and I think this is another massive question for everyone when thinking about coaching as a business enterprise community whatever it might be um is is why are you doing it um and i know many many people if not the majority but many people do do it because they love making a difference um and that's has always been the case for me it still is the case for me uh i take as much pleasure in making an impact on a junior hitting the ball from the first time um as i do seeing mohammed win the British Open or the World Open or any of my players, you know, famous players doing well. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, I value any more or less. I just love the process. So the process of seeing transformation in an individual uh, or a group or a community is really what makes me tick. And um, I think that's really helped drive what I've done and what I'm still doing. Um, and I also really enjoy being a role model, even though, um, you know, I started coaching quite young uh i really value that idea 
and probably want to replicate you know what my father has done and still does for me is being that leader i suppose and that mentor and that person which can um hopefully be somebody that others look up to as a good example i definitely don't get that right all the time but i try to um and that's a strong motivator for me is is being a uh, a strong role model and a and a, a good leader um and for those two things for coaching are certainly at the heart of, of what is needed to be done and the third thing i put in here um to put in quite late actually into this little section was also wanting to be the best why i coach why do i coach why do i coach and i thought well actually having finished psa um around 30 31 years old 47 i am now so a good few years ago but i decided to focus on coaching partly because it's what i love and i didn't want a real job i didn't want to move into uh, any other industries really apart from possibly school teaching but um i didn't want to work to a curriculum and have to do as i was told so uh you know squash coaching was my thing but also it gave me the opportunity it gives me the opportunity to be competitive um and um you know i think that is important because it ne you need that strong driver um and i want to be the best that i can be at coaching i want the players to be the best that they can be so that competitive component is also you know a really important part of of why uh why i coach and i even with the business as well i want the business to be as good as it can be so you know, i think those are sort of three key things there could be more but those are the first ones that sort of really came to my mind so elite squash as a concept um and maybe as a brand began about 25 years ago um when um i started running summer camps so i was in my early 20s playing professionally but every summer i'd come back to exeter where i'm from in the, in the uk and um i'd run summer camps and really that period of, of starting those summer camps really shaped the vision for the future um, and as we start to think about coaching as a business in more context here, you know, this first idea of, of the vision of, of what you want to do with what you have, where you want it to go, what you ultimately see that future environment looking like, I think is so key. Um, I didn't know when I started these summer camps 25 years ago that, um, that I wanted to create uh, you know, a, a big center in bristol with with professional players and juniors and, and start to grow that further afield i didn't know that i wanted that but I, what i did know is that i wanted to make the camps at the time be the ultimate environment for squash players and i kind of highlighted this part as maximize their full potential and actually that's still our kind of strap line now um which really helped me understand that actually it was that attitude to um running summer camps and that value system and that vision is the same as it is now to find every way to make it as good as possible to create the ultimate environment so that every person there has the opportunity to you know gain as much as possible during that time on those camps and um uh, at the same time i think it wasn't straight away but fairly early on we started to sort of create t-shirts and put elite squash names on and so on and, and there was some kind of brand developing and I'll talk about that a bit further down the line but um, that certainly really helped shape um, what the future would then become and um, so having uh, finished PSA um, as I said in my early 30s I'm jumping forward now I'm, I'm, I was based in Bristol I'd won winding down my squash career um and uh i decided right this is it i'm going to go for it with elite squash uh i'm going to really try and build this great environment um in bristol um and um and continue this vision that i'd started with the summer camps um with a view to just creating the the, the ultimate environment where people can really reach their best and and i really clearly saw that it had to be uh it had to be for everyone and it needs to be as broad reaching as possible, partly because I enjoy coaching all levels and all age groups, um, but also because uh, for a program to link, it's great if you can have the three-year-olds going to the five-year-olds, the seven-year-olds, the nine, through the whole junior process, 
and then what happens after the junior process well yeah they can they can disappear or they could go to university so um I, you know very fortunately connected with UE University in Bristol um which uh facilitated the arrival of Mohammed followed by Marwan um followed by Lucas Serm, followed by numerous other professionals now Yusuf Solomon and Ian Yao and and various others so they're all at the university there and um you know that that kind of piece of the puzzle was part of this vision that I wanted to create where you could you could join at three you could join as a student you could join as a teenager you can be a, a beginner adult you can just play for fun you can play professionally you can study um but the opportunities are, are very broad um and that we can cater for all of that so this is kind of whole package environment um and I kind of put a mini Cairo Bristol style but that that's also part of it like a lot of my playing career was in Nottingham um where we had a huge amount of great players Peter Marshall Simon Park Derek Ryan Alex Goff John White uh yeah so many top tens you know were world-class players and um that was like embedded in my mind of like trying to recreate that um, well as uh this kind of a new egyptian thing which was taken over at that stage the, the, the whole egyptian wave of juniors coming through and top players and obviously you know mohammed arrived in bristol at 17 um so i could sort of see uh where he'd come from and i started to understand the more time i was spending on court with him and then with marwan like this different thing that was happening from egypt the way these players think the way they play um is different and I needed to weave that into the the kind of vision that um, that I had. But the, the important part really is that that I wanted this environment that could cater for everyone. Um, and it wasn't about having superstars and everybody else being left out. It was about everyone being able to interact together uh, and a kind of family um, is the best best description really there. So um, as uh that started to grow in bristol like i did have a a logo and a and a brand um not this one but a previous one and and it's sort of simultaneous with the program growing mohammed coming uh we're probably talking 10 to 15 years ago actually so a bit before mohammed but i realized that actually having a name and a logo and a brand as part of this program was going to be really powerful. Um, I didn't know a lot about these things at the time, but um, I live with a couple of guys actually, and I can remember sat down with them and they're saying, you need to create a logo. You need to have a brand behind this. And I had no idea what they're talking about, but I started to sort of figure it out. And I thought actually, yeah, then we could put that name on t-shirts and the kids can wear them on t-shirts and that would help showcase who we are. And I had the beginnings of these ideas that actually, if we call it something, uh, and it has its own identity that makes it more powerful. So um, this this number at the top here, this 15,000, and I put that there because I thought, well, I wonder what I've actually invested over the years into just the brand. Um, and it's probably more than that, but it certainly is that. So when we start talking about the business of squash coaching, without doubt, that's one area where I think I have invested probably more than many people in a similar situation um, because I believe that it was so important. Uh, I'm not saying you have to spend as much money and that's over, you know, many years I've spent, you know, money on, on growing it, but I have prioritized the quality of the look and feel um, of the brand um, uh, and the website um, that you see here. And, and this is, this is phase three or four of the website we had all the ones but looking back I think that um, that doing that helped put me slightly ahead of some of the competition um, which I didn't really know at the time maybe as clearly but looking back I think it was a big big important part and certainly the business of coaching and where we are now in the world brand logos all these things are are part of normal life um, they're inescapable you can't start a business now without all of these things because nobody will even look at you so you know i think it's a very useful thing to to communicate to all of you out there that um you know the look of, of what you have is is also very important but at the same time 
not as important, nowhere near as important as as what I've talked about preceding this, which is really my values, what I'm about, what I want, the quality of what I'm delivering. Um, the logo and all of those things really are the the pretty colours on top, but they help make it look nice. Um, another thing I'd add really for for brand, I remember somebody saying on a, uh, a show once and they just said, you know, brand is not um, your, you know, how nice your logo is or how beautiful the fonts and the colours are. Uh, brand is reputation. Um, and that's really stuck with me because actually that's all you need to think. Um, so who you are, how you behave, what you believe in, plus the brand that you have, that is your reputation. And if you get that bit right, as we know with, you know, Apple and Nike and all these, you know, incredible global leading brands, they, they have they have beautiful branding and marketing. But at the same time, they um, they really uh, they have an incredible reputation of, of high quality uh, service products, everything. So, you know, these things were really important. And, um, I think it really helped me creating a name with a website and an identity. It helped me shape where I wanted it to go as well. Um, probably also maybe something quite important is I didn't call it Hadrian Stiff. Um, and that's partly because uh, I don't really want to. <laughs> it just feels a bit arrogant, but actually, in retrospect, it's worked out quite well because Elite Squash is definitely not just Hadrian Stiff. Um, it's much more than that. Uh, it's many people involved. It's the players. It's it's everything. Um, and I think when you talk about brand, that's that's really what it should represent. So um, those of you out there that are thinking about naming your coaching businesses or or programs then maybe that's something to consider is um you know invest well um take time to get it get the product looking really good um I, and i've always gone to very good people the people that have designed the brand as we have it at the moment um they're really good at what they do and i've paid maybe a bit more for that but i think uh, i think it's been worth it so um yeah, the next part really. So I, I mean, we've we've got this program in Bristol. Uh, we have a name, we have a website, we we have an identity, um, and and then within that process, all the way through, I've then, you know, brought in uh, or encouraged in people who've become part of our coaching team. Um, some who've come and gone and moved on to other things. I've had professional players that moved on and went, carried on with their professional career. Um, Jethro Bins, who uh, is now uh, the CEO of Squash Skills, you probably know, he was part of our coaching team. So we had a lot of really great people um, delivering the programs over the years and the different locations we have, and we still have that now. Um, so, again, coaching as a business, it's crucial if and how and when you can grow a program and I started on my own, for sure. It was it was just me doing everything. Um, but I quickly realised that I couldn't deliver to everyone. Um, it's crucial then that you 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 build a team around the 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 business, um, and just do your best to get the best people. Um, that's one of the hardest things. Very very fortunate that I have you know a great team now. I've had a great team in the past as well, um, and I've been pretty selective about who's involved. Um, and all those team members have to absolutely represent the brand in who they are, how they think, what they believe in, way before how they coach. So, you know, probably wouldn't be too difficult to get level three, four coaches in who've got all the cv and and it looks great on paper and they could be awesome people as well but first of all i want to know you know who they are what makes them tick uh what they really think squash is all about what coaching is for uh and and am i going to connect with them are they going to connect with me and do we have the same vision um or similar vision and uh when you get that bit right the rest is actually kind of easy about getting the coaching skills up and that's experience and time and so on but um the right people are hard to come by um but um they make all the difference 
they make all the difference if you've got a great great team of people and i'm forever grateful particularly during this time now of having such a great group you know we've really pulled together well and um and it's a testament to, to all of them really so team is crucial um so maybe just before i move on to this part um if there have been any questions at this stage or anybody does have any questions in that sort of first first period of where is my development and how the, the brand grew and so on and i suppose you know perhaps t to a point where where we are now um if there aren't any questions i'll keep going if anybody does anything. um <clears throat> yeah i'll uh, i'll there hasn't been any questions but we'll give people a little bit of time if they do want to write write one into the chat then go ahead and do that now i'll right. get the ball rolling with one if uh, if we can um and just kind of just wanted to kind of dig a little bit deeper in what process you use to try and understand your values like it's like you presented that really succinctly there and but just doing it myself i know that this takes a lot of time and um, for the coaches out there that haven't ha haven't maybe invested the time into that sort of stuff where would you start mm. yeah it's a great question um I mean, it, it does take time. And I, I think actually your values, um, they evolve over time. Um, it's probably a little bit easier as you get older to understand yourself maybe a bit more. Um, as I said, so many of them have come from my kind of childhood environments. Uh, so I, I suppose my values as far as why I teach, what matters to me, what drives me um yeah they, they've they've kind of come from as i said my kind of parental environment but also probably then the people that i've been around along the way um that have helped shape that um it's a tough one actually with values if i try writing them down i don't find it very easy i just know what what works for me and i have written them down and I have values for for the business as well, but they keep changing and evolving. Um, and I think nothing more complicated really than almost answering the question like what really matters to you? Um, because if like with with value, sometimes it's tempting to sort of jump on Google and you know you see honesty and courage and perseverance and all these words that's gone on and on and on forever. Um, sometimes I find that actually not particularly useful because there are many words that kind of resonate with you on some level, but what really matters to you, I think helps to really trim that down. Um, you know, health, family, freedom, creativity. These are the kind of things that really matter to me. Um, and then that kind of be distilled down into the coaching environment of, yeah, innovation and, other things and um success uh but it takes work it definitely takes work and you know i understand paul it's um yeah it's a funny one and because it's you as well probably other people can tell you your values maybe more easily than you can sometimes um yeah I'm sure that answers the question <laughs> No, you did. That's that was that was great. Um, it's a tough process to go through, but definitely one to uh, that coaches should do if they're serious about really building something. Uh, there's another one here from Rahul who uh, who who asked if you could elaborate a little bit on the tough times that you faced as you were building the brands. Like, um, it's, yeah. I know it's been a long process for you, but what have been some of the hard hard times that you've had to go through? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, yeah many uh what were the toughest ones i mean i've i've done i've started enterprises that have just not worked at all um for example um at one point it looked like we we're going to expand into uh q8 and i flew out to q8 to meet this chap over there that really wanted to do something quite big and grow elite squash and and so on and so on and um yeah it, it I, I flew out and, and it cost me i don't know one and a half thousand pounds money that i didn't have paid for my flights my hotels food 
um and um and it just never never came together um for various reasons and uh, it was hard like hard to kind of put all that time and effort in and I, I did a lot of investment before that you know how to present and so on and so on and, you know really put time and effort into gunning for this opportunity which I thought could have been great at the time um and it just fell flat uh, and I was like god all that money all that time blah, blah, blah. you know and and it was you know not not like brutal but it was a tough kind of reality it's failed you know um but then I realized later on that actually just the act of going and trying to do that and throwing it all in like a different me just wouldn't have gone um and and wouldn't have tried to do it and it wouldn't have taught me a load of stuff that I figured out from there that then helped me to um you know perhaps make other ventures work so you know that was one we had a club we moved from one club to another in Bristol uh two years in that club just shut and we were completely homeless we had no location um pro players juniors coaches and we were given like two months before everybody was going to be kicked out of this venue so we had no location I then had to quickly uh go to a different club where I spoke to the manager he was looking at selling the venue long story short myself and a couple of other people talked him into actually trying giving us the business and we took over the business to to run the club ourselves which was a complete um spontaneous decision partly because we we needed a location but also because um we know we thought we could do it uh, it was really hard uh really really hard like i was running a club running a squash program managing a business young family sleepless nights um and and then the, the, the long story short there is we ended up selling that business to the current owners who are in there now we're still operating there but it was brutal at one point I thought we'd have no venue and then we did but then in order to have that venue it was very very tough financially and uh, and emotionally so but again you know this it's about as you said at the beginning Paul kind of having the courage to take risks um and and push outside your comfort zone and get it wrong you know, I've been listening to this so much recently. There's multiple podcasts that are out there. Like, if you're not, if you're not trying something that's probably beyond your capabilities and failing at that and realizing it's not right, then you probably aren't growing. Um, whether that's as an individual or as a business, and um, those two examples I just gave probably highlight that quite well. As like they're both, you know, in a way, like one was a failure and then another one was sort of like a disaster followed by something really tough that the winner had to kind of give up and give to somebody else. But either way learned loads um kept us alive it helped me believe in my ability to uh to innovate under pressure um which all good squash players need to be able to do and um yeah i think you know that's uh, that's the way to think about it and um read the book mindset it's a great <laughs> great yeah. book that articulates what i've just said a lot better <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh we've got a few more here so if we quickly run through them uh Stuart asked about your building of the team and he was interested to know whether the, as you build up a team are you looking to kind of fill areas that are maybe not your strengths um or do you look for someone that's very similar to you and share the same skill sets and values great question as well um i mean it, it sometimes is a case that it's about filling a role that we need filling, uh, like a junior coach, for example, junior development coach. Um, but I would definitely say more recently, more recently, probably being the last two years, I've started to realise that um, there's two people recently, a chap called Stephen Thompson, who has just started working with us and He's taken on the junior program, but also in conversation with him through the process of, of him kind of joining our team and being hired, I realized he had a load of assets outside of coaching, which I don't have, uh, which he can bring to the table. So he's come from a kind of economics background and finance background. And although I've got better with that kind of stuff, it's not my strength. So he's really helpful with with kind of you know more on the business side probably and and, and numbers and um, the way he thinks is more um, probably a bit more I'm a bit more of a creative 
uh, my mind jumps around all over the place and I'm a bit of a kind of scatterbrain, but that's also kind of partly my strength as I can push into different areas and, and find solutions or whatever. But um, it's really good for me to have people in the team that are kind of a bit more solid and a bit more focused. Uh, there's another chap called John Welton who, who kind of manages our program in Bristol, who's also just consistent and um, and not you know as i said like chasing shiny things like i do uh so so having those two kind of pillars for me is absolutely massive so i definitely people that that compliment me and actually another one of people that challenge you um that's something again i just read heard recently you know, within relationships it's not such a good thing to have a team of people that all go yeah we're brilliant we're all doing great and you're wonderful and i'm wonderful and it's all kind of nice we want it to be nice we want great energy but you need a team as well that says yeah but i don't think that's working very well and why do you keep doing this because that's not great like surely it'd be better if you did that and, and that's crucial um so yeah but great people but who have their own things to bring their own character traits their own personalities um and certainly with the coaches although we have our kind of our method i'm always encouraging them to take it in the directions that they feel they can be most successful in and, and most effective. Um, I don't tell them to teach like me. Uh, we just work from a similar philosophy and with similar tools, but then they will bring things to the table that are better than I can do in different wealth of different environments. So um, yeah, great question that, and that's very, very important. If you can get that combination of, um, yeah, same philosophy, but um, complementing different skill sets and strengths uh, really important cool okay i'll pick one more um there's a few if we've got time at the end we can pick up on the others uh, so there's one from keith uh, around kind of asking us saying that players often use coaches based on their reputation usually by name rather than a brand did you have any difficulties when you started out with your brands yeah i'll um I think I, I cover that in a little bit actually but that's a, another very good question um i mean we can probably just if you're going to cover it we can move on and then uh and then if if it hasn't if it doesn't get covered then uh we can come back to it at the end maybe yeah sure yeah yeah i think i mean i think i will be i will be able to sort of articulate that as part of the next period because um yeah good question now. yeah nice okay shall i shall i carry on yeah let's go for it Right. So, yeah, um, I mean, we've talked about it a bit there already. Um, and um, I know you did. I think you did a talk on this last week, Paul, uh, about personal development. Um, and, and really all I've sort of talked about almost is in order of of how um, the phases of elite squash slash my development have kind of occurred and, you know, following creating this team of people and um, you know this this brand and and at that point I did have some success with with younger players which you know was a question that's there actually about um about the association with elite squash being successful so we were having juniors that were winning a lot of events as a product of a good program and national champions and regional champions and that definitely really really helped uh to grow the program and then I'll come on to sort of the you know the Mohammeds and so on in a minute but um but, you know, alongside, but probably very much in this sort of current stage where the business is starting to um, to do better, it's established. We've got a good team of coaches. We're based in Bristol. Uh, I'm talking before Mohammed and the pros are there. We had a couple of good, good pros um, in Bristol, sort of younger pros. But uh, it was around that time that I started to to really heavily invest and I put down my my kind of competing rackets now I'd, I'd hung up my my career put that to one side you know very important really again when you want to be a coach a really great coach is that I just don't think you can keep your own agenda or your own playing agenda in that process because it's just not about you anymore so you have to sort of put that to one side and I, I've done that I've kind of right playing is done I'm not going to not hit balls but it's not about me. It's about these players that I have. Um, so what can I do to do this at the absolute best? And, and really around that time, started to think about what 
what I needed to get better at, what I needed to learn, who was offering that. Um, but as you can see, I kind of just took this picture earlier today, just trying to sort of show, you know, I've, I've read and listened to stuff about coaching um, and a lot about movement. Uh, but also um, I did study Open University actually when I was in my early 20s and did a lot of sort of philosophy and history and I still love all that stuff. So philosophy is actually quite a big part, I think, of how I teach. Um, because I th I look at things in a very, uh, I think, philosophical way. Um, so, you know, that's why there's kind of quite a mix of books here. I'm, I'm quite into art as well. So I really like kind of the creative process. I'm really interested in that. I listen to a lot of stuff and read a lot of stuff about the concept of creativity. Where does that come from? You know, how do great creatives operate? What do they do? And so on and so on. And then, but then similarly, like, you see here, you've got like winners as, great book by Alistair Campbell's you know like what is it about really great coaches business leaders that that make them so successful um read business stuff um again John Wooden definitely a big influence as well um basketball coach from from the US um I've got you know kind of many other books and I listen to a lot more audible stuff now but the point here really is that say now more than ever I'm really pushing into this area more and more because of course once you open up this <laughs> literally this book for this kind of opportunity of like well god there's knowledge here here and here and here it just goes on forever so then the, the, the idea is like think about what you need most where you need it who's doing it best and then start bringing that into the picture and absorb that knowledge and um that attitude to getting better without doubt translates into how I coach but I think also um, the players that I coach notice that um, and value that so back to kind of who you are is how you teach um, they can see that I am trying to figure out a better way all the time and uh, and that's really where you know it's not just reading like I say there's loads of stuff as we know out online especially um, but it's um it's essential um so yeah creating successful players and it also sort of the question earlier so as i said we'd already had a, a a program of um successful juniors as a product of, of a great team me putting in 24 7 effort for six eight years um pretty much seven days a week going to tournaments just throwing everything at that to get those kids doing as well as possible um, and then as the, the university opportunity opened up in, in Bristol and we managed to get Mohammed in as a as a 17 year old world junior champion, um, this then kind of catapulted that whole process. So, you know, kind of in answer to that question, so why did he come? Was it elite squash? Was it Hadrian Stiff? You know, what what was it that tipped the balance for him? Um, I think it was a combination of a couple of things. It's got nothing to do with the juniors that I was creating because Mohammed's vision was, I'm going to be a world number one. I want to be a world number one. Where do I go to make that happen? Um, and the fact that I taught some juniors that have done quite well for him, I don't think really is a factor. Um, I think probably what was a factor for him was mainly what Jonah Barrington had to say. Um, Jonah saw that I had value to Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed was with Jonah Barrington in Millfield School from 14 years old. So he was there for three years before he came to Bristol. Uh, so Jonah's view was crucial in that process, unfortunately, because I've got a good relationship with Jonah and he's coached me when I was a young kid. And I think he saw that I could, you know, do do good things for Mohammed and help him. And um, and simultaneously, you know, I work really hard with the university to, to get the best deal possible to get him in because it was very competitive. Um, that helped to kind of bring him into the picture um, and then really it was just the proof is in the pudding I mean <laughs> it's easy to argue in a way that Mohammed's going to be you know screaming up the rankings and conquering the world regardless of where he is and to some extent I think that's true um, but also he needs so he's still here now but he needs and needed an environment that could give him that opportunity so my um you know my role in that is giving him 
the best expertise I as I can on the court, but also making sure everything else is sorted. Uh, that the university is great, that, you know, he's got everything he needs in the city, the courts, you know, and so on and so on. And you know, it goes for all the players, but particularly someone like him who's that aspirational, that important. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, creating successful players, uh, yeah, I, I was lucky. You know, I still consider myself very lucky that he happened to come to Bristol and happened to be who he is. Um, all being well, we'll have another version of him at some point but um you know Mohammed or you know Nick Matthews or any of these people they don't come along all the time as as you all your coaches know so it's about doing a great job with everyone that you have um and and sticking to that and obviously the wider the program the more chance you have of creating a you know a, a great champion out of that but um uh, it's right back to your reputation uh I think the, the, the reputation and the effort I put in from the start really helped to make this relationship positive. And the fact that he's still here over 10 years later is sort of a testament to, you know, good, um, a good working relationship. Um, and I've learned masses from working with him and all of the other, you know, players that I work with, but particularly him being so um, unusually, well, not unusually successful, just, just a different character because you don't, dominate the sport like he has without being um something special so obviously that goes to say that my knowledge and understanding of the sport is completely being transformed as a product of being around and working with him and being at events with him and so on and understanding like, what is it about that kind of person that makes them different from everybody else what do they do how do they think how do they respond to things and um yeah, hugely influential um so i'll attempt um actually, i don't know if i will maybe i'll, I'll try and uh, play this video i've got like a video kind of showcasing a little bit of of what we have in bristol i thought it might be it's quite nice to break it up um i'll probably just have to reshare my screen though so if i um jump off here uh Have to do it again. Let me just do this again. So, if you can just let me know if this is working okay, somebody. Have you got so far so good? Picture of the top of Bristol. <clears throat> it was there. Hopefully, it will come. If not, I might need to share the screen again. There we go. Yeah, got it? Yeah. Does it work if I put it on full screen like this? Uh, no, keep it off full screen. Okay, sure. Right, I'll just play it here. So, yeah, if that's working away. So this this kind of gives, you know, for, for everyone a bit of a, a view, I suppose, <laughs> literally a view here, but a view of the scene as, as it is in Bristol. Um, it kind of highlights a couple of things. Hopefully... Um, what we have and and how that resonates with the players and how the players feel about what is offered here um and that helps to underpin what i've just talked about but also i suppose it it's another thing which illustrates um a bit of investment into to how to showcase what i have um with a you know a nice video so have a have a little look hopefully if this works all right you can see it yeah good. The vision from the start with Elite Squash was to provide the ultimate coaching environment for players. And I strongly believe everybody has the chance to reach their full potential if they have the right environment and the right coaching expertise around them. The professional scene in Bristol has been my main focus really for the last 10 years. It kicked off primarily with a collaboration with UE University, supporting Mohamed al -Shabagi. Yeah, I've been working with Hadrian since 2009. Because it wasn't just about just going to a good university, but going to a city where I can actually train and, and pursue my dream. The uni facilitated Mohamed's arrival in the city, closely followed by his brother, Marwan. Of course, having my brother uh, 
already living in Bristol helped me moving here. So me and Hadrian, we've been working for a long time together and this made such a huge difference to my game. And uh, I'm just happy I made the decision to move to the city. Bringing those two players to the city added to what already was the beginnings of a good scene. It really caused everything to explode from there. So about a year back, I was looking to change up things with my training. I mean, it was one of the best decisions you know, that I ever made. My whole game changed, my whole mindset towards training. The relationship between the coach and the player is uh, very important. It's not just a player-coach relationship, it's more than that. Our philosophy as an elite squash is very much centered around using squash as an opportunity to cultivate maximum potential in individuals. Adrian is very good with like the mental side of squash as well. So we very much teach through the relationship between the mind and the body, seeing the mental side of the game as really the part which unlocks the potential on everyone. I working with Hayden like four years ago. He's really helped me with the movement, my mental side of the game. I took a look from him a lot of things. Where we are now, workout hard side, where we have the gym and squash courts based in the centre of the city, we can deliver the best possible environment for these players. You know, Bristol for me is the, the best place to be. I feel like I have a combination of different energetic city as well as like great squash and great training. And that's part of this world class vision that we have the best players possible, the best coaching possible, and alongside that, the best training environment. Let's go back and share my uh, PowerPoint again. Right. Uh, is that back to where it was? Uh, we've we've lost your your PowerPoint. It was up, and now it's gone again. So maybe share that again. Let's try again. Share. There we go. Yeah. That's it. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, hope uh, hope you enjoyed that video. And so I, I kind of put it on here partly to um to give everyone a bit of an insight, I suppose, into sort of what where elite squash is. Uh, what it looks like um, and and it, it it pulls together a lot of what I've talked about so far uh, and as far as this sort of strong vision of how um, how I want it to be uh, how um, yeah how I want to kind of create an environment which which services and serves these these players and um, not just the professionals but everyone um, but that's Again, where that kind of reputation has come from, you can hear the players talking about there that um, it's somewhere that they they feel not just happy to train in, but happy to live in. Um, which is why I kind of put uh, Cairo creating a vision, which is almost like a Cairo Bristol style. Um, Bristol style being it, it's quite a relaxed city, it's a very creative city, um, very enjoyable, quite European feeling. Um, uh, there's a huge component actually <clears throat> in in how uh, it's helped shape, I suppose, the brand and the the central hub. So Bristol really is our kind of central hub in amongst all of this. Um, and you know these these people kind of being you know testament to that. So yeah, I think the the success of of players is uh, is important, and I completely appreciate that. You know there are many coaches out there on on this call now that you know you may have a, a tiny program of just a handful of juniors or a big one or a, or a national program or whatever. I, or everything that I'm saying here I think is applicable no matter what your aspirations are. If your vision is to have 20 kids really happy playing two three times a week, that's fantastic. Um, but you know stretch that vision, make it as great as possible. You know, aim for it and and do everything you can to make it the best that it can possibly be. Um, alternatively, it could be, you know, to have whatever Scottish squash is the 
you know, nation leading European squash or global squash, whatever that vision becomes. And I think it's all just specific to, to the people involved. But, you know, going back to kind of what I think's helped get things to where they are now is that the strength of the vision from the start and then the investment into that with time, effort, you know, hard work, finances, people, um, negotiations, <laughs> so many different elements, um, help make it happen. And, um, you know, I've, I've not grown up with business parents or I didn't go to uni, I left school at 16. Um, but there's something, some things in me, I think it's partly coming from a competitive background from squash, but also I just so badly want to do it my own way um, <clears throat> and have be able to create my own vision, not in a selfish way, but just in a really exciting way, instead of, in reality for me, probably having to go to America and, and work in, uh, in maybe a more confined environment. I'm not saying I wouldn't do that at some point, but it's not certainly not on my radar at the moment um and you know creating what's happened so far is a product of not having to do the other stuff uh i'm desperate to make this work because this is my ultimate dream so that desperation is partly what what's helped make it happen so far um so yeah i mean as well as i talked about earlier i, I have invested in you know, time in in business knowledge, and um, it's not uh, it's not a strength of mine. Uh, it's not where I've come from. It's not what I studied at school. Um, I'm okay at it now, but I'm not great. Um, but I realised along the way that I have to invest in this and think about it and learn about it, and particularly the areas where I'm, you know, least familiar. Like I enjoy brand and marketing and those things because I'm quite a visual person so the creating the brand of the website and all that fancy stuff like I love that and I could do that all day long but there are many other you know elements to business and that's those are the bits that I'm learning the hard way and again I invest now in others to help make that happen you know fortunate now that we're able to invest in a marketeer who works for us um, and uh, you know I, I subcontract financial modeling and things to other people uh pricing systems i've employed business coaches i still do employ business coaches um and it's all been an investment in relation to what i can afford but often slightly beyond what i can afford as well um because i know that if i don't push those boundaries it's not it's not going to happen and i'm almost scared of it not happening which is another strong driver healthy driver actually um that fear of not being able to move forward um and survive <laughs> uh so yeah the, the investment in business knowledge are important and i you know I, I know i barely talked about the business of coaching well i actually have but the nuts and bolts of it i don't think that was really the purpose of this discussion is to talk about you know the pricing and breaking down all these different elements of, of literally the business what i tried to articulate is more I suppose where my journey has come from and to now um, and how I started with a passion for coaching and a desire to make that as good as possible and then I've brought more people into that and then players have gravitated towards that and then slowly over time I suddenly realized wow I've kind of got a business here well if I've got a business how do I make it a better version and it's relatively recent that I've started to figure this stuff out um, so and I actually think that's quite a good way around of doing it because the other way around of going, right, I want to create a business out of squash and I want to, you know, make a, a, a profitable program, for example, but I don't really know how to coach yet. And I don't really know if I even like coaching or, or this is what I want to do. It's not going to work. Um, you have to do what you love. And I firmly believe this, whatever it might be, do what you love and what you're passionate about. Be true to that and then invest the hell out of it to make it as successful as possible um so the the business part is instead of sort of has, has filtered in as time's gone on and um and become now maybe the most important part as far as keeping the brand moving and growing and so on um and i have various 
bigger visions and aspirations of what could be done um, in the future. Um, yeah, and, and these are the areas I've kind of really spent time in vision values, branding, finance, management, delivery and sales. Um, so much stuff online. I've just grabbed books and, and spent time investing in that, I suppose. Um, and relatively recently, I just talked earlier about that situation with Q8 that didn't work. Um, <clears throat> that helped me figure out this idea of, of growing the brand into other locations. Um, and actually, the time this was done, this location's not quite worked. I have a feeling, actually, the chap that I was going to go into partnership with is maybe even on this call, Chandresh. Uh, and hopefully that little ES logo will be there at some point. But um, yeah, so far we have we have uh, a couple in the UK, um, uh, Moscow and Dubai. Um, but, but yeah, I'm looking to, to grow uh, the brand into a more global family uh, is probably the best way to describe it. And again, why would I do that? Well, um, I love this idea of, which we already have, of, of, a, of a group of people in a different part of the world with the same vision, the same values, creating the same things, building a program of players and um, having successes and then sh sharing that with them, cross-pollinating them, um, traveling to meet them, they come to meet us and connecting the dots. So certainly part of my kind of bigger vision for Elite Squash is, is how, to, uh, how to kind of expand this concept into different locations um, with a view to, to sharing what I've learned um, sharing that with others who have expertise in other areas, but underneath or within this this one kind of brand, um, being able to do great things. Uh, so from where I kind of started doing summer camps, which was really like, let's make these camps great. And that was it. That was my vision. Um, but the attitude is the same. Make it as good as I possibly can. Um, invest in the best I can. I forgot to mention on the camps, I had numerous world top 10 players come in and, and join the coaching team there, which meant the camps all pretty much ran at a loss financially, but it meant that the reputation went up. As my reputation grew then, it didn't require so many superstar names to come in. Um, but I invested at the beginning and, and that's helped kind of get things going. And then, you know, I, I think you just can't stand still with anything. Um, coaching, playing, whatever, you have to be pushing for the next thing. And if there's one of the many things that someone like Mohammed has taught me is that, you know, he'll win something or get to a new level and reach a target or a milestone. And then within no, you know, he'll give himself 24 hours to enjoy that. But then he's already thinking, what's the next thing? And how am I going to get better at it? And how am I going to achieve that? And how am I going to break even more records and, and become even faster, fitter, stronger, everything, you know? So there's, there's no moment of, um i suppose sort of sitting back or being complacent um and uh and uh, that's also you know when you're looking at growing you know growing a coaching business um obviously it's loads of hard work but you, you're just looking for that next thing all the time you know where is it how can it happen and um this requires a lot of energy and a lot of effort but for me when it's working well it, it actually doesn't feel like that much effort and that's because I love it. Um, so I think that's you know a big question for all of you to ask is that if you don't love it, maybe why? Or if you know you're struggling with it, why? And it probably isn't because you don't love coaching. It could just be because you've not quite maybe dreamed big enough or got that kind of inspirational um, view on it. I don't know. Um, so you know, I'm hoping like some of what I've talked about so far will be. Um, will be an inspiration on some levels will be helpful uh and um yeah let's let's have more people doing great coaching creating great things because squash needs it big time uh, it's going to need even more after this period now um it's no use having uh, just one area working well i mean the us is growing really fast um which is really good news but uh, we need the uk europe rest of the world doing the same 
so let's let's hope for that but um thank you everyone uh for your your time and patience i've gone on longer than i thought i would but uh i hope it's been been useful and then um yeah if there are any questions you have at this stage um fire away great stuff thanks adrian <clears throat> um there's a couple of questions that came back and there's a couple of key messages. One of the things that really kind of resonated from what you were saying for me was just that kind of idea of like, it doesn't matter who you're working with. Like you should be, you kind of always preparing yourself for when that world number one potentially comes through the door. So you've obviously um, had the opportunity to work with some of the best players in the world, but I don't think your approach would be any different if you were working with a, beginner that's just just walked through never played squash before um so that idea of treating everyone or giving everyone your best self is key and there was a question from dan who who asked like in the early days where was your where did your biggest growth come from so when you were first starting what was the key to your growth do you feel with coaching yeah um where did my biggest growth come from the camps actually were huge because um, the camps were a transition from doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, where I think all of us would agree if you just have, you know, an individual person that comes on the court, still challenging, particularly if it's very different levels and needs and character types and so on. There's still a challenge with one-on-one -on -one coaching, but um, I can remember doing the camps first of all and, having whatever 16 18 kids turn up and just thinking like how am I going to stand in front of this group of people and sound like I know what I'm talking about um and and be able to you know lead this two three four days of camps um and uh I spent a long time prior to those camps writing down where we start what happens next to the minute through each day to try to help make sure that I actually, um, I still do that now actually, but just make sure that I had a chance of delivering it in a professional way. But um, I mean, even now I still get, I was nervous about this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I think you need that a little bit because um, otherwise you might get complacent. But yeah, I think, I think the camps were a big one. And uh, that, that really, matured me as a coach um maybe working with ireland as well starting to work with national teams and when, when me and you paul were working together suddenly having to stand in front of a team um and start delivering to them it's a different type of um coaching that's needed in a way having done a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff uh and then more recently within the last i suppose eight ten years but like being you know behind behind the scenes with Mohammed, but being being with him marwan joel joshna you know all, all the sort of top end players i suppose but particularly those sort of top few where it's just so critical they're at the absolute top of the game and there is a, a huge sense of um i've got a tiny margin to get this right um because as we all know, between games, you'll know this so well, of course, Paul as well, but between games, you've got 90 seconds and the circumstances are, you know, very variable. The emotions of the player are very, very, very variable. So um, having that was is difficult, full stop. With juniors, it's difficult. Learned a lot doing that as well with juniors in the early days, going to competitions and helping them and figuring that out. But then certainly as time goes on and it starts to become like a British Open final on you got, I don't know, Mohammed playing Greg Gaultier and, uh, you know, he's he's kind of looking at me going, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I, I've lost it, you know, and, and, and I'm thinking, Jesus, how the hell am I going to get this back on track? What do I do right now at this moment? I need to get these words dead right. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Um, that really yeah, helped uh, or has forced me to kind of develop those areas and um, improve those areas. So, you know, I suppose in answer to the question, it, every environment is beneficial, but the more challenging it is, probably the more impact, impactful it's going to be. 
Um, but like you said, Paul, coach lots of different people, different styles, different age groups, because that asks different questions of you as a coach. Uh, coping with four three-year-olds on a court is probably, from many levels, way more difficult than coping with the world number one. Way more, it's a completely different skill set, you know, and then you could have a completely different situation where you have a, I don't know, whatever, you know, a, an older person who can't move much, and but they really want to get better, like, what do you do with them? Um, so, yeah, I think challenging environments is what it's all about. Get out of your comfort zone. But for me, uh, camps, pros, um, working at high level competitions where the stakes are high um, and the pressure's high is really where um, you kind of learn the most, I think. Yeah. So to sum it up everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it is everywhere. But as I said, the more challenging, the better, because obviously, you know, that's that's it. You can you can kind of go, well, this is my world of coaching. I'm just kind of like working with these people and this is where I feel comfortable. And, and that's fine. But if you want to really get better, step out of that, you know, and go and try and work with someone different or group, of, you know, maybe it's just a group of women or it's just a group of guys or it's a mix. Um, opportunities everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Simon asked, the, and Don, people can start putting a few more questions in, in the chat if they have anything. Uh, Simon asked one, about the uh, the golden question really about the Egyptians and how you mentioned about how having the the Egyptians come over really helped shape the way that you coach. Uh, so he was wondering um, how the way that they develop is different than what you see in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, still does shape it now. Um, I think... The first thing that springs to mind is that uh, they are, or perhaps the other way around of putting it is we tend to overcoach, coach too much, too technical, probably in Europe, maybe even in the Western world, actually. Um, in Egypt, Yusuf Solomon put it very well, actually, one day when we were doing a session, he said, like, in Egypt, they just say this is what I want you to do with the ball but I'm not going to tell you how to do it they don't even say I'm not going to tell you how to do it they just say do that with the ball find a way to get it over there no get it deeper put it longer you know they're not actually saying right open the racket face hit it high on the front wall um so of course there's technical coaching and there's some kind of structure but it's much more about figure it out here's the circumstances which are normally competitive normally very high intensity um very highly charged and then under those circumstances figure out a way to win this rally even in a boston drive um versus where i think we I'm not saying it's all wrong but i think where we get it a bit wrong is uh, that the environment is too set up meaning that the players just kind of get coached by numbers, do this, do that, do this, do this, you know, and it's it's too structured and too laid out really in a way. Um, the chaos in in Egypt is it's on the court and it's on the streets. Um, and uh, I think that's a big part of it. It's cultural. There is no structure. There's no rules. <laughs> get a taxi, there's no rules. The taxi driver will just take you wherever and overcharge you. You know, there's the you have to find a way to figure out, you know, what's going on and and be street smart. You know, so and I think that whole culture is is woven into how they play squash. Um and um yeah the numbers of course like that's a massive part of it. There's huge numbers we talked about earlier if you're delivering to hundreds of juniors and you've got a great program you're going to pop out one or two uh, that are very good and then it's you know up to the expertise from there but um so i think it's that that environment that cultural environment which is built around challenge and figuring it out rather than i'll tell you how to do it yeah problem creating rather than problem solving exactly Okay, nice one. Um, <clears throat> we've got we've got a message from Rahul who's interested in being part of Elite Squash India. So I'll I'll pass you on to him uh, later on. Nice. Uh, there was a really good one from Nikki, um, which kind of is is an interesting one about the 
it's a ra quite a rapid expansion of your business when you as a career what happens with your kind of time management it's the same seem like there's a lot that lies in, up on you i know you have your team but how have you managed to try and be the coach that you are and trying to build this business as well and and do everything that you need to do mm, good question with great difficulty is the answer uh something i'm learning for sure um I mean, more recently, I'd say last 12 months, 12 to 18 months, um, I have coaches in roles and places, which mean that I'm not needed um, too much. Uh, so anything really happening in Bristol, Bath, Torquay area, if I disappear, that just runs. Um, so we've got couple of lead coaches and then a, um, a small team of assistant coaches that are there for backup and to to help out where needed. Um, I have a lady that manages all of our inquiries. Uh, my mum does all of our bookkeeping and invoicing. I um, have somebody else running the marketing. So as part of that team that I talked about earlier, you know, those people are in their particular roles and places, which means things will just keep moving in Bristol, e even with the pros where John, my sort of next in line, I suppose, will do uh, pressure feeds with the pros and he can step in if I'm not around and still give those players uh, you know, what they need. Um, so that's that's one part. And then I think, you know, really the, the other part is is about the big plan, um, which is, again, an area I invested in with with a business coach is is really going, what is it that we're actually doing and what are the directions we're going in? And um, that helped shape it to make it easier for me or more likely that I don't scatter myself too much <clears throat> because um, within a plan of course it's like right this is what Hadrian does this is what these guys do and this is what this person does so if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do I can put myself back on track and essentially that is you know nurturing and growing franchises and supporting those people and, and coaching the, the top end pros um the rest of it is done with the team um so yeah a huge huge part of uh keeping things ticking over without me getting overstretched but uh, also without the quality dropping you know that's the that's the biggest challenge um keeping the quality up as we grow um and uh something will be an ongoing challenge for sure but again great people you know like Russia is a brilliant example. We've got such a great team of people out there. I'm really confident how they lead it. Uh, I've got real belief in what they do. Uh, and I talk to them a lot online anyway. So every week I'm in contact with with all these different locations, making sure that they're, you know, in a good place and I'm helping them. Um, but if the people are great, it doesn't require quite, quite so much uh, input. But um, yeah, certainly not easy. Great stuff. Um, okay, well, we're kind of coming towards the end of uh, of our t allotted time. Um, so I just want to thank you, Hadrian. I think that the reason why I wanted to get you on um, was to to kind of it's quite an inspiring story uh, that you've kind of shown shown us over this over this presentation, um, which is which is brilliant and. The, but kind of the the other side to it is where you are now is probably quite far removed from a lot of coaches. But I think it really shone through that you started off at the same point as what most coaches on this call are. Like you were just one man band in a club trying to kind of build something and pay the bills. Yeah. Uh, and obviously it's expanded to something huge now. But um, for any of the coaches that are kind of in the position that you were 20 years ago, um, what would what would be your advice or the first thing that you would t ask, tell people to to go and explore to try and expand themselves as a as a coach and as a coaching business? Sure, yeah. I, mean, I think really where I started the the way I started the presentation with is um, as I said, we all begin our coaching with whatever we have gathered along the way. Um, as I said, it, it certainly doesn't mean if you haven't played pro squash or have a, a high standard of playing career, like I'm fortunate to have had that and that has helped. But um, that doesn't decide 
how good a coach I'm going to be as well. Like um, the, one of the books in that pile that I showed on the photo earlier, John Wooden, from what I understand, like he was a he was an English teacher that got called in to to back up the coach that had just left and um, the university in LA, uh, which one is the basketball team? Anyway, he won 14 titles back to back on the basis of taking his values and his beliefs in education and behavior and teaching and so on and just applied it to basketball, just taught himself basketball as maybe one of the most successful coaches in history. So he had very strong value set, very clear idea of how he thinks people should behave and how people should learn. Um, and an incredibly clear vision of what that looked like. And he created this kind of pyramid of success that, that is in the books. So I'd highly recommend reading them. So I think it's just, you know, take what you have, set a vision. You know, I say exactly the same with players. If you don't have a clear vision of really where you want to go, um, you, you're probably not going to achieve anything like your potential. Um, and uh, I think that's, and I said that vision doesn't need to be global domination at all. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it needs to be something which is really exciting, inspiring, um, and and um, you know, influential on people. And if that's, like I say, a small junior program in a small island in the top of Scotland, amazing. Like, do it. Make it happen. Um, but hopefully you can kind of see from from what I've talked about so far that I didn't set out to a global brand or have a world number one or thing like that. That wasn't my initial plan, but my initial plan was to to just do the best possible coaching I could uh, and, and to try and maximize every person that was coming into contact with the business. And I think if you can set that as part of your vision and then see how, where that could go, you're going to, it's going to be a great start. Um, and I mean, yeah, for, for anyone out there listening, like feel free to get in touch um, through easy. Just go through the website on the Elite Squash website and contact us. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to, to help with any more advice. <clears throat> we will be running some some online courses as well eventually for, for coaches to just help with these different areas of coach development. So um, perhaps you can circulate that at some point as well, guys. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, as you can see, I'm really passionate about it. I think it's a, a fantastic job to be in. I mean, it's a great sport, but just doing something where you're influencing people for the best. And um, uh, I've not talked about winning much, if at all, in that whole presentation. I've talked about getting the best out of people. Um, and, uh, and that's about character, values, attitudes to life, to sport. Um, and uh, and that's where it's at. And if, if you're doing that on any level, small or big, you're doing a great thing. So um, well done, all of you guys, and keep it going. Think big. Go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Adrian. I'll just pass it over to Alan to do any roundup for the, for the, for the webinar. But thanks a lot, Adrian. No problem, Paul. Good to talk. Yeah, I think just to echo those thanks as well, um, Adrian, thanks for your time and um, really interesting to hear the, the journey that, that you've gone on, so much appreciated. Um, and then, yeah, just thanks to to those that joined. Any any final questions, ping them in, but I think we've we've covered them all. Um, we'll obviously have another topic next week and we'll we'll follow up again with a different link. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what that topic is, but it's on our website, um, so hopefully some of you can, can join us there, uh, then. And in the meantime, yeah, just get in touch again um, as... Paul and I always say, like, feel free to drop a note if we can help in any way. But um, yeah, apart from that, thanks very much. Cheers. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks for inviting me and well done for creating this uh, this great resource. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Okay, thank you.